Well, hello, everybody, and there's a couple people I don't know yet, and um, I and plus probably probably some other folks who may be watching on recording. So I'll introduce myself. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she they pronouns, and I'm the executive director here at All Greens Belong Vermont. And welcome to Brain Club, um, where I uh, will 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 be discussing um, urgency culture in the workplace. Let me share screen. Um, before we uh, before we do that, though, I'll introduce um, our community agreement for Brain Club. So, um, as many of you have figured out already, all forms of participation are okay here. You can have your video off whenever you want it off, um, and even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. You know, you certainly don't need to make eye contact with the camera. You know, please just. Do what needs doing, walk, move, stim, fidget, eat, leave, come back, and everyone is welcome here of, of, of all ages. Um, and you are welcome to communicate however you are most comfortable. You can unmute and use mouth words, you can type in the chat box, you can do, you know, any, really any, any, any way that you can communicate is, is uh, comfortable here. Um, so a word about language. Um, and by the way, I have I have the kind of brain that as the hours go by, it is harder and harder for me to get my words out of my mouth. So uh, I I'll just I'll just name that. So a word about language. Um, you'll hear myself and maybe other people. I don't know. Um, uh, using identity first language when discussing um, aspects of 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 their identity. For example, I say that I am autistic. Um, only because um, it is part of my identity and other people might use other formats to describe different things. So you are welcome to use the language that, um, that, 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 that you most identify with. Um, and speaking of identity, we affirm all aspects of identity here and we respect and protect one another's access needs. And so um, one of the things we like to say up front is that today is for educational purposes only. It's not for medical advice. And um, um, although we will be discussing some themes of some hard topics, um, um, we, we just say that we really wanna make sure that for purposes of processing trauma, that that's taking place in a therapeutic setting um, because we, we, are, we, are, we are not able to provide the adequate processing um, here at Brain Club. So we just, um, individual traumatic experiences are best processed in therapeutic settings. Um, Earlier in the month, uh, some of our Brain Club regulars um, uh, had, had, had some pretty wonderful discussion around how to actually bring an anti-urgency culture even to Brain Club. And so to create space and processing time um, for a broad range of communication related access needs. And so um, to just um, enhance uh, the quality of sharing um, and, and really moving beyond taking turns talking. So periodically we may pause and give some time for processing and kind of create some empty space um, so that people who have the kind of brains that um, uh, get it, you know, jumping in and finding their way into conversation that's ping-ponging around quickly is, is not accessible. We wanna create space for everybody. Last bit of access, um, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. And depending on your version of Zoom, it might be the live transcript CC or the more dot, 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 and you're choosing show subtitles. So urgency culture, sorry, too many windows popping up. There we go. So, um, for, the, for, for, for some of you who've been part of the last couple of weeks talking about this topic, um, I uh, included some excerpts from my new favorite book, um, Parenting for Social Justice, written by um, a group of Vermont authors. Um, uh, define shared set of norms, values, ways of life, assumptions about how the world works. And while some are obvious, some are not obvious. And that uh, many aspects of culture um, are determined based on the normative power structures. And when we think about urgency culture, um, this idea of the like important needs to be done right now, like 
not everything is in that upper left quadrant of the do now must be done right now do all the things right now and yet they're the messages sent a lot of times that everything is urgent when it is in fact not um and those that 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 chronic set of in, in exaggerated urgency um is 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 really stressful and we know that stress um it, 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 can be toxic, toxic and harmful for health. So and that's why we began this conversation. Um, and so again, as I said, urgent matters, things requiring immediate attention, things popping up, demanding your attention, you know, but but while urgent tasks are unavoidable, um, spending too much in that state is 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 not healthy. So um, the, two weeks ago, we talked about this um, in, in, in terms of like home culture. And then uh, last week we had a community panel talking about their experiences of urgency culture in everyday life. And um, some of the messaging that, 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 that has led to that, that people grow up with. And when we think about, um, uh, and, 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 and we often use this term of niche construction, which is uh, Thomas Armstrong's term to describe building a life that works for your brain. Um, part of niche construction um, is um, thinking about how are we in, uh, establishing neuro-inclusive norms. And um, this was our community advisory board. So Auburn's Belong has a community advisory board that informs all of our programs. And so um, our uh, in the spring, our advisory board spoke about access and exploring access needs, talking about access needs, negotiating access needs, communicating your access needs. So what is an access need? Anything required to meaningfully and fully participate in one's environment or community and everyone has access needs, you know, people of, with all types of brains. And when we think about um, whether this is in the physical environment, technology, um, and in this, the, the emotional communication, social spheres, um, you can see where um, there's a lot of subtlety that goes into this for an individual having their access needs met. And when we think about how this, how this plays out in the workplace, there are a lot of people who don't have their access needs met at work. And what we don't want we don't want the square peg, peg being hammered to fit into the round hole because what happens? You break the peg. And so when we think about neuro-inclusive employment, um, and by the way, um, uh, Auburn's Belong has a neuro-inclusive employment bright spotting program where Vermonters can nominate their employers um, who are creating environments where people with all types of brains can thrive. Um, there's, there's, there are some threads. We've been running this program for a little over a year now. And the threads that have come up are, um, and they match what's in the literature, um, things about the physical environment, communication styles and supervision style, workplace culture, meaningful work, flexibility and choices, autonomy, individualization, and like zooming out and looking at the workflows and routines and kind of stomping out the defaults. Because anytime you have a default, everyone else's brain who does the thing differently is othered. But today we're going to be focusing on workplace culture. Um, and we'll be joined by um, a, an asynchronous panel of community members, including um, someone from one of our winter 2023 neuro-inclusive employment bright spots. Um, and we're going to collect, we're going to connect these concepts of, of culture to a zoomed out um, bigger picture. Because part of creating um, just equitable workplaces is in looking at the, the frameworks, right? And that we're avoiding, not only are we like actively um, naming and working to uh, work against bias, but we're also avoiding supporting systems that perpetuate unjust systems. And when viewed through a social justice framework, we want workplaces, we want societies, communities where all people have their needs met, have autonomy and decision-making power, are safe, are treated with dignity and respect, and are able to develop their full potential. When, and, 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 and when we think about 
urgency culture. Urgency culture is rooted in so many power systems that are not just. And when we think about, um, back to that in a second, when we think about capitalism, um, where people's, you know, and, and, and the messages where people's value is, de- is based on what they produce, not who they are. And when we think about, you know, all, you know, like, you know, all the isms, racism, colonialism, classism, ableism, all of it, um, when it, when it was first brought to my attention that urgency culture can be uh, viewed through the lens of, of perpetuating oppression, once I saw that, gosh, that made it a lot easier to want to distance from it. And so one of the things that has come up um, in, 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 in brain, the Brain Club conversations around this um, over, the, over the past couple of weeks was that like, oh, wow, I never thought of it that way. Oh, wow, now I'm thinking about it that way. Anyway, so, so um, uh, uh, maybe, maybe it was last month, um, I attended um, the Vermont uh, um, Businesses for Social Responsibility um, uh, quarterly um, uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion um, uh, circle, um, and um, several the, the urgency culture topic came up, um, and we talked about this in the context of of neuro inclusive employment. And um, what came out of that was a, a, several people who wanted to wanted to come and talk about this in Brain Club. And so I'm very, very excited to um, introduce today's asynchronous panelists uh, who were um, kind enough to, uh, to, to share their time with us. We did some pre-recorded interviews and edited them and put them all together. And we'll play that video in a second. Um, Tegan Koppler um, is a project associate at Encore uh, Renewable Energy Systems. Kelly Putnam is the Director of People and Purpose for Lawson's Finest Liquids, who is, um, the, uh, Lawson's is one of our um, winter 2023 neuro-inclusive employment bright spots. And Matthew LaFleur, who is a disability advocate and a member of our community advisory board here at Alburns Belong. And so with that, um, Lizzie, would you be able to share screen and play our video? And this video will run about 20 minutes and I'll be facilitating the chat as we're watching so we can keep the conversation going and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion afterwards. Okay. to what they're doing. And yet, I rarely hear about urgency culture, a, you know, a focus on productivity and efficiency and, you know, like that stuff. It is the opposite of dismantling power systems. Yeah. So what do you think of that? I know I was reading the there was this resource that listed 10 characteristics of white supremacy culture and when they got to urgency culture characteristic it was saying um this is an ironic characteristic because the urgency of capitalism is is really um it makes one lose sight of the urgency of like these justice problems. Yes. Right. That's yes. It, and if you have to pick, mm-hmm. you pick non oppressive power system. Right. 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 And what kind of blows my mind is that. So how do you be urgent in the yeah, the non-oppressive power system? Like, yeah. And how do you urgently fight for, you know, justice and 
you know, all the senses, because they're all connected, when working, you know, 24 hours a day isn't, that's not the way, you, yeah, you can't, to, to do, to do the work, you have to take the breaks, and you have to go for the walk, and look at a tree, and enjoy the world around you, and then sit down and have a hard talk with your neighbor or read a book or whatever it is or show up at a there's so many ways to do the, to, to to work for good and so it's how to and then this is the part that we talked about the other week and that you brought up is like how do you do that in a work setting where you so like my company in solar like we are making renewable energy projects and, and that's so important for fighting climate change and bringing clean energy to communities um but then and and how to do that in a really holistic way and we're trying but it's still ever, you still have to always be thinking about like, the, the day to day, the, what do the, and I liked what you were saying about the people you want to make sure your people are okay. This has been a lot, like it's been, I've gone down the rabbit hole. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting. I just find myself sometimes feeling like, Oh, I should be doing more. I should be doing more, but but I've kind of checked off some like the things on my to do list. So maybe it's time to go for a walk. <laughs> Sit. But it's actually so so that message of I should be doing more. That yeah. is you being controlled by an old narrative, a narrative that is bigger than you. Um, it's these assumptions that many of us have grown up with about you should be doing the thing at all times, what you need to be productive because that, because your value comes from how productive you are. That's the message that so many of us grew up with. Right. So many. And, and even when I tried to really kind of, um, I, I, they, I noticed bringing that lens of like being productive into the way I then try and rest or yeah um i personally um if someone says something like you know i'm concerned you're doing all the things you know or, what are you doing for self-care like i find the term self-care like so infuriating yeah because of like, like like because often what people mean by that is that like that there is a right way to do self-care that's the things from the list of right whatever and like Check them off. I don't know. I think like part of my self care is, I mean, I hate that word, um, but like part of taking care of myself um, is to like have conversations about things that are meaningful and yeah. authentic and like, I don't know, maybe make some kind of impact to make the world a little better because um, I just like, it's interesting. Like, so I have a six year old and like we talk about power systems all the time. And even if we're watching a cartoon, I'll be like, power over. And so, like, she has that framework about how, like, power over is bad, um, and it's bad all the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you certainly, you know, power over, different from, like, power of connection, power of influence, power of knowledge and expertise, like, just all the different powers. Um, and power over is not, is, is not healthy for individuals or communities. Right. Right, right, power over, right, and, and how much, right, thinking about, it, I think about the individual, because I, I, maybe I'm, the communities I'm in aren't, um, I think I think about this a lot as an, at an individual level, and how um, trying to, yeah, have power over myself almost. Mm. Like, autonomy. Like, power over self is autonomy. autonomy. And, you know, you need autonomy. Um, and, 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 and there are so many people for whom autonomy is an access need. If you don't have autonomy, 
you're not regulated. You're then don't have full access to your brain um, because it's not safe. Um, like, and, and, and this is, you know, different for different people with different brains, but like, I have the kind of brain that when, when I, when I am recognizing power over or an attempt at power over, I'm like, oh, unsafe, fuck it. Like, I gotta leave this environment. And there's so many workplaces that like, people don't have autonomy. Mm, Right, right. To say what they need and what they yeah what they need and And they don't know what they need they don't know what they need they've not been told they get to have needs they get to have needs because you just got to do the thing because that's what we do that's what we do here because i think that even in a culture like i i do feel like my work culture is pretty um pretty good at the flexibility that you need to like get your work done but it's so hard at, on an individual level to really and I think this might be because I'm new to the workforce and um um and I think this is definitely like linked to perfectionism which is another characteristic it's part of, it's part of the system all right. Of it. yeah uh-huh all right so how to how to really kind of um follow through with and so not maybe this is bring personal things to it as well but like not feel bad about it right. how do you yeah so like I know as a like I, I I I honestly like I've never actually used this term like I identify as a recovered perfectionist okay. like um which is so I don't think like I mean that's kind of a new thing that I think that I might claim that term um, because I became a good enough, it's good enough person. Um, like, like when I became a parent after like, it, it was like life circumstances being like, no, you have a finite capacity. Like I never thought I had capacity. I thought I could just keep doing and doing and, doing and, doing and like just something had to give. And so anyway, um, and, and, and for me professionally, like my progress notes, they're, they're not, they're like bare minimum to be, you know, check the box. Um, but, but they're, they're good enough. And so like, you know, it's, it's really important for me as a parent that my child not struggle with perfectionism in the way that I have struggled with perfectionism most of my life. Um, so like I am actively anti-perfectionism training just like I want from a, from a social justice lens, like the way that we would be anti-racism and anti-ableism and anti-classism and anti-ageism and like all of it. I like, I mean, I, I've started thinking about like anti-urgency culture um, and, and, and anti-perfectionism and anti, you know, like all of it. And so I think, I think this is just part of it. So you as a recovering, as a, as a recovering, uh, you know, early in the process of recovering perfectionism, um, and I got to hop to another meeting, but, um, but you, you know, you, you come to this culture, you're new and no one has explicitly named for you that this is a good enough culture, if in fact it is. So like, I find it, you know, in a position of leadership, I find it really important that I name for my staff. This is a good enough place. This is a good enough culture. Um, we are looking to be actively anti-perfectionism here um and I have it's my job to name that otherwise people just do the thing and they they assume that where it's been elsewhere is the same here and it's not I I I wonder how um just like the the uh the the theme of of, 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 of of balancing between productivity efficiency and individualization like how does that how does that land on yeah. to your brain? Yeah, I think it's such an important topic because business sort of setting is designed to meet deadlines and always be working, whether you're sitting at your desk or you're not. There's so much responsiveness expected and, um, you know, the email notifications popping up, folks calling outside of, you know, your your general work hours is huge. Um, so I think one thing that, that I've gotten feedback on from 
a, a few employees is that when their managers encourage them to turn off those notifications, whether they're on PTO or if, you know, getting them in the evening makes you not be able to think about anything else, then that's a time when if someone really needs to get you, they can find another way to do so. Um, I know I'm someone that can't stop looking at my email notifications. So uh, I think having that message explicitly communicated and saying this it's okay like yes you're a, a crucial part of this team and if something comes up and I need your expert opinion in a really timely manner I'll probably reach out in a different avenue if that's okay um but I think setting those boundaries and having them be respected and and ideally helped if the company can help support them and establish them um those are huge parts of it and I think just that open dialogue and creating a setting where it's not Someone's not scared to tell their manager, I, I don't think I can hit this deadline and, and here's why, here's what I'm struggling with. And then working together to find alternative solutions, whether that deadline can be pushed or if it is you know, something compliance related that really you have to hit that metric, how can you do so as a team? How can you work yes. together? Um, and just find, find other avenues to make it happen. Um, but I think that culture of having that safe space to even just have that conversation can be really hard to come by sometimes, unfortunately. Absolutely. So like one, what, uh, uh, some of the things that just came up for me as, as, as you were describing um, all of, all, all of those nuggets of gold um, yeah. is, is around transparency of ground rules. Like one of, one of the, the, you know, what we would put forth as a best practice of neuroinclusive employment is explicit ground rules because mm -hmm. there are many brains that if you don't name the thing, um, it is not, it is not known. Yeah. So if you, even if you in your heart of hearts um, truly believe that anything goes in a meeting, that you can have your video on or off, if you don't name that, it doesn't count. Um, right. So, so, so I, I really, I think that as uh, one of the things applied to urgency culture here is that, you know, from, from the top down, one practical Thing to be done is to name the thing we are not expecting you to be on all the time um, because I think especially because there's I mean there's so much like emotional trauma from working in toxic work environments that I think there's almost the assumption that it's that way everywhere and so if you want to intentionally have it be different at your place of employment you know you name that yeah totally and I think too the power dynamic can come into play as well if you're getting a directive from someone who's either your supervisor or maybe two levels up, those are really hard situations to be put in and feel comfortable standing your ground or, or honoring your boundaries and expectations. So I think anytime that that could be set from above and modeled, even more importantly, yes. um, is really the ideal scenario because it is, it's tough. It's really tough. It is, it is. And if you think about, you know, like uh, urgency culture in, 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 in many might say is rooted in capitalism, is rooted in like oppressive power structures. And part of the demand of being, you know, you know, it, 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 of being on all the time is a power over dynamic. And so yeah. in, if, 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 it's, if, if there is an imbalance in power dynamic, I think the responsibility falls to the person who has more social capital is in a place of super, you know, supervisors, but it's, it's, it's your responsibility to name True. of, of like, I am not expecting this of you. It is normal to in fact leave work, whether it, you know, even leave work, even if you are working remotely, leave work and be done. And I'm not going to intrude upon this time. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, I think having structures built in. So there are ways to safely call out those uh, sort of, incongruous moments would be essential yeah. one. one practice we found really effective here is just to, I conduct stay interviews um so you may have heard of exit interviews when you're chatting with an employee and they're on their way out and it's there's pros right they're usually more candid when they're on their way out they don't have anything to lose and um it can be really valuable feedback but but the stay interview the goal is like okay how can we actually get candid feedback, create a safe enough environment that people feel like their job won't be at risk in any way if they're sharing what they really feel. And, and that gives you a chance as an employer to proactively increase job satisfaction and, and do something for retention prior to getting a two-week 
two weeks notice and maybe mm-hmm. you try and keep them. But if you can do it before it gets to that point, it's so much better for everybody. Um, Absolutely. When you think about, I mean, if, 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 if we are going to use the, you know, unhealthy yet ever present, you know, productivity, efficiency based mindset, it, it, it is, it is a loss of productivity to keep having people quit their jobs and having to hire and onboard new people. Like it, it's, yeah. it's win-win for people to be self-actualized in their jobs. Mm-hmm. When you zoom out and you think about all the systems of oppression um, and that like the, 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 the idea that the pressure to do the thing all the time is, or, is because like people get the message that value comes from what you do and what you produce. And I think that's gross. What do you think? It is. It's, you know, it's about, uh, my, you, you said it right. You hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's about, you know, who had, who can afford it and who does not, who cannot afford it. And, you know, with, you know, racial and discrimination that, you know, that we see across Vermont and in our schools and just a walk of life, you know, in Vermont, it's just like, it, it seems to be like, you know, we're being divided against people of color, non-people of color, of how to, you know, interact with each other. But it, it, the way I look at it is, you know, if I can be more, more over empowering empowerment over the other individual that that makes you feel good but in reality all you're doing is hurting communities and yes it is very very gross because it you know it was founded on before you know how christopher columbus you know it was all founded on how it got started in the right States, in violence power over oppression and that's 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 the narrative that has persisted it has it persisted so long, but people are, you know, like you said, they're somewhat oblivious to that or try not to understand as much, or they want to try not to understand it, or they try to ignore that, yeah. you know, kind of culture. They it's try privilege. to and dismiss it yeah. because it's just how our culture, you know, is. Yeah. I can't yeah. tell, you know, there's nothing we can do. The way I look at it is that there's nothing we can do. Like, look, look at switch, you know, and is, is set and done. It takes it takes progress. It takes time, but ignoring it is just making it worse. Ignoring about it and just being oblivious about it just makes it worse because you know that that's wrong, and you're trying your best to stay out of it, but you can't stay out of it because it in, it also brings in white culture too as well. How does that how does that become in, intermixed too as well? How does that intertwine with what we see too as well? Right, right. And I think that, you know, you've hit the nail on the head that um, power over um, hurts everyone. It hurts individuals at the margins and it hurts whole societies. Um, it's, it's, it, it, and, you know, part of being oblivious, you know, is, 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 is privilege. Um, and part of it is like, I mean, but really, if you zoom out, you say there's there's nothing controversial here. This is wrong. This is wrong. You have, and we have to have these conversations. You know, having these discussion and conversation, it's the only way we're going to help you help ourselves, but also help the society that we have to make meaningful change in. Yeah. Basically, yeah. we ha- the only way change is going to happen if we discuss about and have that conversation sit down. And have those mean we we can't ignore it. We can't sit there and you know try to evade those conversations because you know yes it's in our culture. And with me, it's just you know may I be that voice? Do I want to be that voice? Do I think I have the courage to be that voice for others to say this is wrong? We need to move past this. I mean keep our culture intact, but need to move past the rhetoric, the uh, the ableism the discrimination, the racism of what are, we're living in the past, clearly. We're living in 19, 1900s, and we should move past that. Yeah. There's no long, race, racism and hate has no place here, literally. Not in society, and definitely not in Vermont. Amen. 
you know, I really, I, 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 when I do my editing, I'm going to really make sure that and we've been so, so, uh, the last couple of weeks at brain club, we've been talking about oppression. Um, and I, I, like, so the setting has been really set to get people thinking about the aspects of day-to-day culture that are actually rooted in racism and capitalism and ableism and classism and all of the isms. Um, and there's no place for that here. And so we got to be talking about this. So I think that, you know, it, it, we're, we're trying to get people to zoom out and say, you know, what am I doing that is actually perpetuating power over even if it's not, you know, they wouldn't identify it as racism, but it is because power over is, 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 it's all the same. And it's a going, that's the correct. If it's going against you, it's already discrimination. One of the things that I'm hoping that people take away from this conversation is that I think to connect urgency culture in the day-to-day with a social justice framework because once you see it you cannot unsee it hey lizzie you can end share screen all right sweet so yeah um that am i still sharing yes yeah you're good you're good so I just want to, I want to pause and really, especially Matthew's comments at the end, really, really sit with that. If we're saying that messages of power over are hurtful to individuals and communities, and if we're saying that there are routines and practices that are normative and that the prioritization of productivity and efficiency is rooted in the rooted in the messages that are harmful then there's no place for that in workplaces so i wonder what you all think about that Um, this is Jana. I'm staying off camera. Um, so I was just going to say, that, you know, I work at UVM at uh, the library and our culture is not terrible. You know, I don't have an oppressive boss, but I'm oppressed by, as I was mentioning earlier, by emails and, and just, I'm just inundated by junk information that I don't need in my brain. <clears throat> But um, what occurred to me just now is if we could change the culture of supervising from supervising people to supervising the work. So our bosses, so to speak, are not in charge of us. They are in charge of making sure that the work gets done. So there's probably a better approach to supervising going forward if your, your, your approach is, okay, what do we need to do to get this project done as opposed to why isn't so-and-so here to do their job? <clears throat> so, yeah, supervising things, not people. I love that, Shana. I think that is 
So important. Um, and John and Jessica are agreeing. Um, love that Shana is supervising the work, not the people. That requires a culture of trust, they say. And Sierra says bosses should be in charge of advocating for their employees to have their access needs met. Right. Mm. So the people have their access needs met. And the work, first off, the work comes secondary to right. the priority of the people having their access needs met. And guess what? More work's actually going to get done. When the there, <clears throat> just on the way home this afternoon, I, um, there was a quick NPR uh, interview that I just caught the, the, the very last bit of. And the gentleman was saying how cer certain European countries are looking at a four-day week because they're learning that less is more. People are more productive when they're not made to just come into work for the sake of punching the clock or for the sake of the work week or whatever. So there's so much needs to get, get changed. So it, it, like I said earlier, it's going to take several generations for all of this to sink in. Yes, absolutely. I wonder um, how, how this, um, you know, this is landing for other people and feel free to use the chat or unmute. Hey, this is Jessica and John's here. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I loved, um, Sierra, what you just said in the chat about bosses being in charge of advocating for their employees to have their access needs met. I see that as a part of, see, some of it's about bandwidth, some of it's about prioritization, but the access needs thing is huge. I recently, I work at a bigger company and I recently took a manager, I'm not a manager, but I took a manager training called Disability Fundamentals for Managers. And a lot of it was basic, you know, disability 101, which check I already got, but also a lot of it was like, literally like, how do you deal with an employee disclosing and what's the proper way to do that? And it was very good training. Actually, I was a little surprised. It was third party through, I think, disability colon in, which you may be familiar with as an advocacy organization. Anyway, so that was a wonderful resource, but, you know, I work in a larger company that has someone to make sure that module exists and that training exists. And I wondered if folks in your own um, work or life experiences have had opportunities for bosses or managers to, to be trained in basics like that, because I think most managers may not know how to handle accommodation beyond just being a compassionate person. Right. And um, we, I, I don't remember when it was, Lizzie or Sarah, maybe you can help me out. We had, um, we had an attorney come and present at Brain Club, maybe September or October about, about that concept. Anyway, we'll find, we'll find the, the, the recording and we'll put it in the chat. I'll look for it in a second if, if, if someone else can't find it. Um, the other thing I'll mention is like when, so Aubrey's Belong does neuro-inclusive employment trainings. And in addition to, you know, if people have a particular, you know, if employers have a particular situation that we're problem solving around, um, you know, we do that too. But where we're starting for most of the people that bring us in for trainings is that of if you create a neuro inclusive workplace, your employees don't need to disclose disability because you have created an environment where your routines and practices are, are, are inclusive of people with all types of brains and remembering that um, there's so many people with invisible disabilities who don't actually know that they have disabilities. They just know that they're struggling maybe. Um, and so, you know, and yeah, like Sierra is saying, uh, thanks Shana, um, Sierra, Sierra is using the term universal design. That's exactly right. If you offer things in multiple different ways 
multiple flexible ways of doing the thing and you give people freedom and choice to pick the one that works for best for their brain, you're going to, you're, you're going to be more inclusive. You're not waiting for people because, you know, it, it, in a world where you're one, um, you know, contingent on the fact that someone one knows they have a disability and two knows what their quote reasonable accommodation is, um, you know, you're, oh, thank you, Sarah. Thanks so much for finding the, the recording. Is it recording in the chat about um, the, the brain club I mentioned um, with the uh, attorney from uh, the uh, from Vermont Legal Aid. Um, okay, uh, CD saying, I really love the pause we have been practicing here to reflect on the messages. It really allows for the reflection of reflexes of urgency to hurry and respond. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's, um, yeah, um, we, in, 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 you know, in, in, once we have this lens, um, it just takes practice, I think. It's, you know, I think that um, I can only speak for my own self that I have a lot of like habits around around urgency. And now that I've made this like connection with my cortex, with my like, you know, the part of the brain doing like, you know, the hard work of spotting that pattern and deciding I want to like rewrite these neural pathways. Um, it's still it's going to take a lot of practice. And we and we try to practice it. Um, you know, I can only speak for, for, for us at our, at our team at All Brains Belong, but it's little things like, um, you know, I might, I, 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 I might say to, uh, uh, Sarah, Sarah, can I, can I, can I tell, can I tell the story about, about your, about, about your practicing around, around email and being less responsive? Sure. sure. So, um, uh, and 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 uh, commonly, commonly, um, I'm observing that people write back to me too quickly, and I'll say, "Do you leave your email open?" Well, yeah, it's, it's, that's that's why would I not leave the email open? I'm like, huh. is that comfortable? And or how comfortable is that? And like, you know, it's, it's, I'm actually not going to put you on the spot, Sarah. I'm going to like speak on the on the general because this is like, I mean, I think I've had this conversation like three times this week, like the same exact conversation around like, well, that's just what I've always done. It's like everywhere I've worked is like that way. You keep your email open because that's what we do. It's like, did you know that you don't have to leave your email open? You don't want to, you're welcome to leave your email open, but you don't have to. Like you can actually just like intentionally check it when you want to be available. Or like the other day, was it yesterday? I don't know, some other day. Um, Sierra and I, we try we 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 decided we were gonna try an experiment to taking email off our phones to just like be less available and have to be intentional about like sitting down at a computer to like, you know, receive the bolus of email. Um, I don't know, I've never done it before. Um, I mean, there was a time in which there was life that happened before like we even had this technology. Um, but I don't know, it's like, it just feels like, like it feels big, but I feel like it's really important to try to practice, just, just practice having something different. Um, Jess and John say, CD, what a great point. How can we build pauses into our work meetings, allowing silence or allowing reflection on a question, allowing breaks in long meetings, being transparent about deadlines, being transparent about everything, including, um, so today I was in a meeting with one of my team members and I said something and people just nodded. And then like five seconds later, I changed my mind. I was like, oh, that thing I said before, that's a terrible idea. And then somebody somebody else was like, yeah, that is a terrible idea. I'm like, did you feel pressure to agree with me? Oh, I feel like that, I, I'm surprised by that. I wanna unpack that. And then we like spent time in a meeting about that because I feel like it's, it's, it's healthy to be able to voice to to voice whatever you or not necessarily voice it's 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 help, uh, uh, it, it, to be able to express your ideas. Um, and I I the 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 other 
the other thing is so so um so, something else that um Kelly Putnam, our panelist, spoke about that didn't make it into this clipping. Um, we'll, we'll we'll use it in a different brain club. Um, is actually uh, Tegan also talked about this about modeling, and so like really when you have imbalanced power dynamics, it's really important for um, you know the 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 the, the person with you know, whether you're going to say like more social capital or like in just leadership positions, like it's really important um, to like not put the onus on, on someone who is being supervised to like stick up and, and say like, no, I need a change, right? Like, Cause that's, that's not, that's not okay. Sierra. Yeah. I, um, I think I've been practicing trying to um, model this in patient visits, but also in like interactions with everybody of like, hey, do you want to think about this and get back to me tomorrow? Because that's my favorite phrase to use is, yeah, let me think about it. And I'll get back to you tomorrow. And offering that to people and being like, oh, I didn't realize that I could not make a decision about which medication to try at this visit. Or I didn't realize I could wait and reply tomorrow about whether or not we get together this weekend. Um, people just don't realize that a lot and it can be really easy to just have that script and put it in everywhere. Yeah, it's just, it's modeling. Um, David says, I can't imagine most of the organizations I worked for ever embracing most of these ideas because they're far too big and bureaucratic. I wonder what I might have done um, if I would fully realized what alternatives could have been. Imagine knowing and respecting one's access needs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, it's all about the delivery. Like we talk about things more directly, I think, at Brain Club than we do. Like if I'm doing an employment training, like I'm not typically this direct it's like very oblique angle um in terms of like if we're, if we're really thinking about how we have this epidemic of employers that can't fill positions and can't keep people in positions um and we're saying that one in five people have brains that learn think and communicate differently than the so-called typical brain even though that's not really a thing um but like there's a lot of people whose access needs are you know, far more likely to be unmet. And like, I don't know, seems like the way you're doing it's not really working, society. Um, like that's that's the angle I'm typically taking of like, oh, that's interesting. Or if it, it, it I mean, anyway, there's, there's just any any number of other ways of going at this other than like the thing you've always done, it's wrong. Um, Sarah says, um, especially when there's an imbalance of power, it feels like an answer must be produced on the spot versus taking time to think about something. Right. And um, that's that's not irrational. It's like based on lived experience, like in most elements, there is pressure to do the thing and there is judgment um, associated with not doing the thing. And there's like, you know, habitual responses to, you know, to, to question asking, because if I don't answer the question, you know, some, some, you know, bad performance review or, or, or whatever. Um, and that's, that's what we talked about two weeks ago at Brent Club um, is, is, is around the internalized ableism um, that, that, and how urgency culture connects to internalized ableism. Um, and uh, Lizzie, can you find the recording for that to put in the chat from from uh, February seventh? If you can find it, otherwise, it's fine. Cool. So, um, uh, and 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 you know, speaking of of internalized ableism, I'm also going to connect this to shame, to the big picture of shame. Like, there's so much, there's so many negative experiences, not just negative, but like profoundly painful experiences um, that so many of like, you know, if we're, if we're thinking, you know, the workplace or otherwise, just so many like memories that live, you know, the trauma that lives in the body. Um, and, and that often like, per, per, you know, these like, micro, per, you know, perpetuations of urgency culture often come in a response to the shame that was felt 
when when practicing an alternative. Um, and so I'll 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 cut I I I I I say this to introduce the topic for next week's brain club. So it's our first brain club book chat. You do not need to have read the book, um, but we're going to be talking about the themes from the book. I thought it was just me, but it isn't by Brene Brown, talking about shame um, and the um, you know identifying the experience of shame um, and connecting it to the, you know, the bigger system, the bigger picture of the, you know, the framework, the sociocultural framework that drives some of these things and those messages that get, you know, um, just, uh, you know, laid down like these neural pathways that get, get laid down as young children um, about, a, you know, about what's, What's normal? Um, and uh, for 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 those local to Montpelier, um, there's a few copies of that book uh, that our friends at Kellogg Hubbard Library were kind enough to put on reserve for us. And um, and and uh, at Bear Pond Books, they have a couple of copies in stock that they ordered for us here in Montpelier. Um, and again, if you haven't read the book, please come anyway. Um, so that with that, thank you all so much for coming and uh, we'll see you. We hope to see you next week. Bye, everybody.